Too quiet uh, for me. Uh, Beijing is uh, hot. It's a hot day. It's mm -hmm. uh, yeah. It's uh, over three, uh, 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 30, 33. I 33 see. to 35, yeah. You know, we, we didn't have the terrible storms that they had in Belgium and Germany, where now more than 80 people have been killed by the rain and the storm. But the other morning, the morning before last, we had a succession of uh, thunderstorms, uh, ice balls, heavy rain, uh, and uh, it's good for our garden, but uh, not good for, for people. But I, I saw a picture uh, that my wife uh, showed me from uh, the northern suburbs of Beijing, where there were ice balls the size of golf balls that were falling, falling and did a lot of damage. And I remember those kinds of storms in China, and uh, they can be quite devastating. Mm -hmm. yes. Um, ladies and gentlemen, uh, we have, um, uh, thank you so much for joining us from across the world. Um, my name is Farad Asif. I'm the founder president of the Institute of Peace and Diplomatic Studies. I warmly welcome all of you to this important webinar on celebrating, of course, the 100 years of Communist Party of China and views from the globe. Our friends, distinguished uh, professors, uh, faculty members, representatives from across the world are here to share their views about the 100 years of Communist Party of China and how this, com this party has given the impetus for the country to be as global leader as it is today. So we'll be celebrating that uh, and we will be sharing the views how this has happened over the past whole century and what are the results, what ha happened. So uh, Friends of PRI Forum, uh, ladies and gentlemen, was launched this year with a series of conversations to find and build connect connections among, among different um, stakeholders, importantly, uh, universities, uh, faculty members, uh, academicians, media um, associations across the Belt and Road Initiative, countries who are part of it. And then we had hosted a conversation on uh, how the uh, business enterprises across the PRI countries. So these are series of conversations that were interesting. And this Friends of PRI Forum is aimed to assist President Xi Jinping's larger vision of building a community of shared future for mankind. And the forum is a knowledge, experience, and opportunities for the individuals and enterprises across the BRI uh, to converge and share their knowledge, experience, and build synergies as the vision is, uh, you know, the embody of the entire vision. Um, the forum is also meant to highlight the significance of BRI uh, to the world through effective use of technology, networking, linkages to uh, cement the ties across the, this entire big network. Um, and this has been initiated by the Institute of Peace and Diplomatic Studies, a bit of glimpse about Institute as well. Institute of Peace and Diplomatic Studies is primary, primarily focusing on public diplomacy, think and do tank. Uh, we aim to provide strength to Pakistan's effective role on peace and intellectual growth through innovative and in, uh, you know, innovative research, effective advocacy, dialogue series and modules, and through consultancy services to research, uh, we are providing uh, you know, in the thematic areas of diplomacy, leadership, and peace building skills. We are only primarily Pakistan's only think tank founded by the father of peace studies, global father of peace studies, Professor John Galto. And you can see all of our work on our websites as well. So this uh, webinar that we are hosting today is discussing about all about how the 100 years of Communist Party of China has um, contributed not only towards China, but also globally how it has inspired uh, the action that is required for, for, for a built a community of shared future. Um, we are so honored that today uh, we had been shared um, by uh, a congratulatory letter um, that I will be sharing with you all from uh, our very dear friend, of course, partner, um, Ms. Uh, who is the head of the Good Neighborliness, Friendship and Cooperation Commission of the Shanghai Cooperation Organization. Um, she is uh, Ms. Zhang Wei, who is the Secretary General of this Good Neighborliness Commission. Um, and uh, the letter says that um, the Secretariat of the Good Neighborliness, Friendship and Cooperation Commission of the Shanghai Cooperation Organization presents its compliment to the Institute, of course, on the occasion of the centrality of the CPA, uh, CPC, the Chinese Communist Party of China, Your Excellency has sent 
sent us the congratulatory letter. Of course, we had shared the conversation with them. Uh, we speak highly of this webinar and believe that it is of great importance to comprehensively study the century old history of the CPC from scientific and practical experiences. The CPC is a political party that seeks happiness for the Chinese people as well as progress for mankind. We have sufficient regions to study the historical logic theoretical logic and practical logic of the history of the CPC. Uh, the world has witnessed that the CPC leading the Chinese people to achieve rapid economic development and long-term social stability and contributed China's solutions to the international community. China has always worked to safeguard world peace, contribute to global development and preserve international order. Objective and rational analysis will constantly debunk lies and rumors help more people view China and cooperation with China from a just perspective and oppose political bullying, Cold War mentality, and pseudo-multilateralism. This year marks the 70th anniversary of the establishment of the diplomatic ties between Pakistan and China, and over the past seven decades, regardless of the changes in the international landscape, China and Pakistan have respected trust, supported each other, and of course forged an all-weather strategic friendship. The rock solid and everlasting friendship between our two countries has become the most precious strategic asset for both of us. The GNFCC is willing to work closely with us. Of course, it depends on the collaboration that we have signed recently in June on the two sides, making public diplomacy better serve the development of the two countries and people's well being. Thank you so much for this wonderful congratulatory letter to us. This means, means a lot. Uh, with this, I would like to request Ms. Pang uh, Chuangzhu, who is the DCM Minister Consular and Embassy of the People's Republic of China to Pakistan, to have the floor in his uh, keynote speech. Ms. Pang has remained before coming to Pakistan as DCM of the People's Republic of China in Sri Lanka uh, before coming to Pakistan. Thank you so much for joining us, Ms. Pang. The floor is all yours. Can you see her? Uh, Ms. Pang, you have to unmute yourself, please. You have to simply unmute. Yeah, thank you. Sorry. Thank you, my friend, my dear friend, Mrs. Farhat Asif. Thank you so for your invitation and organizing of this uh, very important event. And I'm very glad to hear about the Mrs. Zhang Wei's letter uh, for this event. That's really very inspiring for us. And uh, dear friends, I just saw my old friend, Mr. Abe from Sri Lanka, but now I didn't see, see him. So hello, everyone. I think uh, friends, ladies and gentlemen, uh, very good, good afternoon. First of all, I would like to extend my gratitude to the Institute of Peace and the Diplomatic Studies and the Mrs. Farhat Asif for hosting today's webinar to celebrate the 100th anniversary of the founding of the Communist Party of China. On July the 1st, the CPC celebrated its uh, 100th anniversary and this is a great event both in the history of the CPC and also for the Chinese nation. Mr. Xi Jinping, General Secretary of the Central Committee of the CPC, de delivered a very inspiring speech, which was well received by Pakistan and the international community. I would like to extend my thanks to the Pakistani government, political parties, and the people from all walks of life who have sent sincere blessings to CPC. Since its funding, the CPC has taken the task of seeking happiness for the, of the Chinese people and the regeneration of the Chinese nation as the founding mi mission and has led the Chinese people in winning the long-term and tough fought for their well-being and happy life. Uh, I think all of you know that after 28 years of continuous efforts, the CPC fully won the trust from the people, ended the old China's tragic fate of being split and bullied, and founded the People's Republic of China, then began a new chapter for the nation. 
To think of poverty, the CPC set up a socialist system with Chinese characteristics, as well as an independent and relatively complete industrial and national economic system to improve people's livelihood. The CPC conducted the reform and the opening up and enabled China to realize rapid economic development and become the second largest, largest economy in the world. Since the 18th CPC National Congress in 2012, under the strong leadership of CPC Central Committee with Xi Jinping as the core, the CPC has led the, the party and the China to go through historic transformation and again historic achievements, push the socialists with Chinese characteristics into the new era. According to the opinion polls, the support rate of the Chinese government among the Chinese people have surpassed 90% over past years, rated number one in the world. The key to understand China, I think, is to understand the, the CPC. How can the CPC grow from just over 50 members to over 95 million and sustain its ruling for over 70 years? There are many reasons, but I think the main cause should be the CPC's people-centered approach. That is to place people at the first priority for the party to rule and revive the country. First, rely on the people. As Chairman Mao Zedong said, it's the people and only the people who are the driving force to create world history. General Secretary Xi Jinping also emphasized that the state is the people and the people are the state. The people are the source of strength of the CPC, as well as the solid foundation of the People's Republic of China. In its journey through revolution, construction, and the reform and the opening up, the CPC has always relied on the strength of the people. Take the Huaihai campaign in 1948, for example, the Chinese People's Liberation Army, which had only 600,000 troops with backward weapons defeated the, the Kuomintang army, which had 800,000 troops with advanced mm. weapons. How come? Because there were 5 million farmers and workers that supported the PLA with food, transport, and other assistance. That is why we call People's War. We gain strength from people and conquer difficulties by people. Second, for the people, for whom we serve, we serve is of fundamental nature to any political party. The CPC is a royal representative of the fundamental interests of the majority of the people in China. The party has no special interests of its own apart from the interest of the broadest mass masses of the people. In the fight against the COVID-19 pandemic, the CPC had insisted on taking people's life and health as the first priority, doing its best to prevent more people from being infected and saving as many patients' lives as possible. All efforts were devoted to saving lives, be it a baby born in just 30 hours or a 108-year-old senior. The cost for treating COVID-19 patients was fully covered by the government. The CPC cared about the lives and the health of every overseas Chinese citizens and implemented the spring vaccine program. At present, more than 1.18 million overseas Chinese have been vaccinated. Third, rooted in the people. General Secretary Xi Jinping always says, the people are the sky above us and the earth that underpins us. The biggest political advantage of the CPC lies in its close ties with the masses, while the biggest potential danger of it as a ruling party is to distance itself from the people. 
in order to win the battle against the poverty. Over 255,000 teams and more than 3 million officials had been sent by the CPC to poor villages to stay, live, and work together with the local poor people fighting on the front line of poverty alleviation. Every official has made great personal contribution and sacrifice to this end. And each official represents one department or organization thus utilizing the institutional resources to support poverty alleviation. Ladies and gentlemen, dear friends, the CPC not only seeks happiness for the Chinese people, but also strives for the cause of human progress. On July the 6th, the CPC and World Political Party Summit was successfully held. General Secretary Xi Jinping pointed out the CPC will make new contributions to humanity's search for ways to modernize, make new contributions to share the development and the prosperity for all countries of the world, make new contributions to improving the well being of mankind, and make new contributions to humanity's joint response to common challenges. The CPC always touches great importance to exchanges and the cooperation with Pakistan's political parties and the people, and would like to work together with all stakeholders to build a closer China-Pakistan community of shared future in the new era. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, uh, Ms. Fang, for sharing this important um, keynote and sharing why it is important to study uh, CPC. Uh, I'm so honored today that uh, I've been joined by Mr. Tao Tao, who is the Deputy Secretary General of the Chinese uh, People's Association for Peace and Disarmament. And uh, Mr. Tao has a, word, you know, a rich experience of not only serving as highest positions at different levels in uh, different countries as well, but he's also a, a, a writer of a book on Western European Socialist Parties and European Integration, which was published in 2001. So Mr. Tao, the floor is all yours. Thank you, Chair. Oh, distinguished guests, I'm honored to be invited to this webinar hosted by IPDS. I'd like to take this opportunity to share my view on the theme of 100 years of the Communist Party of China, view from the global. In the important speech, as a ceremony marking the centenary of the Communist Party of China, General Secretary Xi Jinping pointed out that over the past hundred years, the party has united and led the Chinese people in writing the most magnificent chapter in the millionaire long history of the Chinese nation. The great past we have pioneered the great course we have undertaken and the great achievements we have made over the past century will go down in the annals of the development of Chinese nation and of human civilization. The, one, the 100 years of the CPC are the journeys of making and keeping to the original aspiration and the founding mission. Over the past 100 years, the CPC has united and led its people to go through a long way of realizing the great rejuvenation of the Chinese nation. Here are some important points in the party history. In July 1921, the Chinese Communist Party was founded and had been shouldered with the historic mission of achieving great national rejuvenation. In October 1949, the People's Republic of China was established, which was a history changing event for China as well as the world. Since 1978, represented by reform and opening up the cause of socialism with Chinese characteristics has been promoted, enabling 
trying to find a path to realize the national rejuvenation. And today, socialism with Chinese characteristics has entered a new era, and the great national rejuvenation is embracing an unprecedented bright prospect. Over the past 100 years, the CPC has united and led its people to accomplish and promote four great undertakings, namely revolution, construction, reform, and rejuvenation. The first period, we call it the new democratic revolution. Through party battles, the CBC has united and led its people to defeat Japanese imperialism, overthrow the counter-revolution rule, accomplish the new democratic revolution, and establish the People's Republic of China. In this way, the party has put an end to China's history as a semi-colonial, semi-feudal society thus securing the national independence and the people's liberation. The second period is the period of socialist revolution and construction. The CPC has united and led Chinese people to carry out both the socialist revolution and the socialist construction. In this process, we have established socialist, socialism as our basic system and achieve great success in the socialist construction, bring about the most extensive and profound social changes in Chinese history. The third period, we call it a new period of reform, opening up and socialist modernization with several sum summary and in-depth introspection of the historical experience, the CPC has united and led the Chinese people to carry forward a new great revolution of reform and opening up and promote the socialist modernization. By doing so, we have found, we have found it uphold, safeguard and developed socialism with Chinese char characteristics. The fourth period, is the new era of socialism with Chinese characteristics. The CPC has united and led the Chinese people in pursuing a great struggle, a great project, a great cause, and a great dream. In this new era, we have ensured coordinated implement implementation of the five-sphere five integrated plan and the for prompt comprehensive strategy. In this new era, we have witnessed the party and the country making historical achievements, undergoing historical changes, achieving a moderately prosperous society, and setting out on a new journey of building a mod modern socialist culture in all respects. Over the past 100 years, the CPC has united and led its people to make five major contrib contributions to China, the Chinese people, the Chinese nation, the cause of socialism, and the whole humanity, respectively. CPC, CPC's great contribution to China is the miracles of rapid economic development and long-term social stability. The party has, has led China to spend only a few decades to complete the 100-year-long industrialization process for developed countries, thus exploring a path of modernization in a Chinese way. The great contribution to the Chinese people is the fact that the party has brought about the historic resolution to the problem of absolute poverty, which has existed in China for thousands of years. Chinese people 
have truly become the masters of their own control and, the, and their own destiny, marching towards a happy future of common prosperity. The great contribution to the Chinese nation is the fact that the party has led the nation to stand in the world with a new image. Achieving the tremendous transformation from standing up and growing prosperous to becoming stronger. The great contribution to the cause of socialism is the fact that the party has made socialism with Chinese characteristics the backbone of world socialism. As scientific socialism is radiating great fatality in China. The great contribution to the whole humanity is the wisdom and the solutions that the party has shared the world to address prevalent problem, problems. China's own experience has proven to be a brand new choice for countries who wish to facilitate development while maintaining independence, and that the right path leading to a human community with a shared future has become a historical inevitability. While 100 years has passed since its founding, the Communist Party of China is still in its primer and has a bright future of lasting greatness for the Chinese nation. We firmly believe that since the CPC has the scientific guidance of Xi Jinping thought on socialism with Chinese characters for a new euro, enjoying the strong leadership of the CPC, Central Committee with Comrade Xi Jinping as the core and has the strength coming from more than 95 million party members and more than 1.4 billion Chinese people, the CPC will definitely continue to create a greater glory in its second hundred years. So this is the end of my speech. Thank you. Um, thank you so much, Mr. Tao, for uh, providing us a huge background of what are the four bigger contours of entire hundred years. Thank you so much. Um, uh, now I would like to request uh, Honorable Professor Harvey Dodsian, who has uh, who has a very good friend, of course, and has been written uh, tremendously about China and uh, has is, is a senior fellow at the Center for China and Globalization. He has also published more than 200 columns emphasizing how important it is for arts, culture, on Belt and Road Initiative. He's also currently serving as a non-resident research fellow, Think Tank Center for China and Globalization. Uh, we always are, are remain at awe of hearing his uh, words. Uh, Dr. Harvey, uh, floor is all yours. Fine, very much uh, happy to be here today and uh, learned a lot already. So a hundred years ago, China was wallowing in its century of humiliation. Back then, it was mostly a collection of fiefdoms run by contentious warlords. It was really a mere shadow of the previous powerful centrally governed country that had led the world for several thousand years. How times have changed from dark night back to bright light led by the CPC. In America though, this success has been lost in translation. It would be news to virtually every American, especially these recent five years. Our leaders have increasingly demonized and blamed China at every turn for what are primarily our own homegrown mistakes and missteps, even predating Donald Trump. It's also a perfect storm of hate and of racism. Americans have long been conditioned to abhor communism no differently than Pavlov's dogs were conditioned to respond to stimuli. Red baiting didn't start or end 
with our Wisconsin Senator Joseph McCarthy and his ruthless mid 20th century witch hunt. And they continue to this very day with Republican attacks on all things that are socialist. Pointing the finger at China is only the latest in the racist blame game of yellow peril hysteria that began in the mid 19th century America. I have to tell you that in answer to Senator McCarthy's frequently repeated question during his infamous hearings, where he falsely character assassinated many reputations, have you now or ever been a member of the Communist Party? My own answer is no. And in fact, as our great American humorist Will Rogers once said, almost a century ago, I don't belong to any organized political party. I'm a Democrat. Now, I've worked in the American government. I've been a vice president of ABC TV network. I lived most of this century in China. I try to be objective, but like the lyrics of a famous song, I've seen both sides now. So I'm in a good position to compare and contrast the two countries and the two systems. My conclusion is that in the real world, no political system is flawless. All have imperfections because human beings are imperfect. So the question is, which model is best? Uh, but the question is flawed, since just what, as one size doesn't fit all, one model doesn't fit all. The answer really depends on many variables, including cultural and historical background. So the real question is, which model is the best fit for a given country? Unlike the former Soviet Union or today's America, China doesn't force or push its model on any other country. When the Chinese model might not be suitable for our 330 million Americans, it well suits the vast majority of China's 1.4 billion citizens, as evidenced by independent public opinion polling both long-term and focused on the global pandemic, still ongoing in much of the rest of the world. A long-term study released last year examined the relationship between Chinese citizens and the CPC from 2003 to 2016. In this period, the study found a near universal rise in average satisfaction towards all four levels of the Chinese government, that's township, county, provincial, and central, based on more than 31,000 interviews. For example, in 2016, the last year the survey was conducted, 93.1% of respondents were either relatively satisfied or highly satisfied with the central government's performance. It was a 7% increase from 2003. In the same period, however, Township governments, the lowest level examined, the approval rate jumped from 26 to 44% in 2003 to 70%. Is that fake news? Is it too good to be true? Is it just communist propaganda? Well, no, consider the source. It's Harvard's Kennedy School of Government. The study is the longest academic study of Chinese public opinion ever conducted by a research institution based outside China. And regarding the COVID-19 crisis, the Chinese public's approval of its government is similar in an unrelated anonymous study of how the government dealt with the coronavirus. Of nearly 20,000 Chinese citizens across 31 Chinese provinces, it was conducted in April 2020 as the virus was winding down in China but exploding elsewhere. More than 90% said they were satisfied with how China's national leaders managed the outbreak. In fact, nearly half reported increased trust of the central government. So COVID actually increased people's satisfaction and support for the Chinese government. Now this study was further corroborated by one done a month later by the Chinese data lab at UC San Diego that showed a similar increase in the Chinese public's trust of its leaders. Is there any secret sauce in China's and the CPC's recipe for success? My experience in China suggests two important ingredients. 
three-dimensional experience-based leadership and systematic planning. At Harvard Business School, students like me take a deep dive into a host of diverse business cases of success, of failure, and everything in between. The intent is that by the time we graduated, we would never ever be confronted by a real world situation we haven't studied or analyzed. The CPC's model actually goes Harvard one better. A CPC cadre who rises to the top doesn't do so according to the Peter principle often found elsewhere of going with the flow, allowing incompetence to rise to the top, but increasingly is given actual real world leadership challenge in China, starting at the village level on up in government, SOEs and NGOs, so that China's senior leaders must have proven themselves as having served the people to climb further and further up the ladder. In this case, unlike in the Peter Principle, the cream rises to the top. Losers like Trump wouldn't ever, ever have a chance in China. The second element is China's five-year plan model, which systematically solicits input from all stakeholders, whether experts or citizens, over a period of years. This model works and the statistics speak for themselves. I have to tell you, when I was young a long time ago and was growing up in the then very prosperous Detroit in the 1950s, our parents told us to eat all our food because children in China were poor and hungry. And in 1953, the first year of China's first five-year plan, poverty and economic suffering were indeed the norm. That year, China's population was 583 million with a per capita GDP of 54 US dollars. Today, under the leadership of the CPC, China's GDP has grown by a factor of nearly 200 to 10,400 US dollars with a more than double population of 1.4 billion. During that time, an astounding 850 million people were lifted out of poverty. But the CPC doesn't rest on its laurels. Despite COVID, China has met its first centennial goal of building a moderately prosperous social society in all respects. And China's current 14 five-year plan is already mapping China's future on the path to achieving the second centennial goal of becoming a great modern socialist country by 2049, with an intermediate goal for China to achieve its basic socialist modernization by 2035. As someone who has seen both sides now, if past is prologue, there's every reason to believe that the CPC will succeed. Thank you very much for listening. Thank you so much, Dr. Harvey. It's always a pleasure to hear from you, especially your experiences of two worlds and then you, how you view and you know balance it out. Thank you so much for your kind words. Um, I would like to request uh, my next colleague who has, who has to leave early, uh, Dr. Lu, Deputy Dean of the China ASEAN Research Institute, Quanxi University, China, who has remained as the Secretary General and the Standing Director of the Quanxi Law Society, International Law Institute, and uh, is also the Senior Visiting Scholar Institute of the China Studies, University of Malaysia, uh, to have the floor because he had to leave early. So, uh, Dr. Liu, the uh, floor is all yours. Thank you, Fahad Asif. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you very well. Thank you so yeah. much for joining us. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Uh, first of all, I would like to thank the uh, Institute of Peace of, uh, and uh, Diplomatic Studies for inviting me. Uh, also, I want to give my apologies uh, because um, I have uh, another emergency conference to attend. So uh, I'm afraid I have to leave after my uh, presentation. Uh, today, I want to share my opinions from the perspective of uh, party diplomacy. 
As we all know, political parties play an essential role in the political life of the country. Meanwhile, as international exchanges have become closer and closer, the international role of political parties have become more and more prominent. In terms of China, on December the 19th, 1994, Li Shuzheng, the Minister of International Department of CPC, not only used uh, party diplomacy to summarize CPC's diplomacy work for the first time, but also clearly pointed out that party diplomacy is an important component of China's overall diplomacy section. After the development of these years, CPC has made very successful achievements in party diplomacy area. Nowadays, we can see CPC aims to be an uh, important force to promote the programs of human civilization. Uh, I want to share more uh, views about that. Uh, firstly, uh, party diplomacy is an important platform for China to link domestic governance with global governance. In some words, Global governance is an intention of the uh, domestic governance in the international context. Uh, during the past years, China has succeeded in uh, eliminating illiteracy, uh, a historic resolution to the problem of absolute poverty, uh, inviting other countries to jointly build a Belt and Road Initiative and increasing uh, global connectivity. While striving to improve the well-being of its old people, the CPC has also been committed to uh, promoting the world's common development. Uh, in his 2017 New Year speech, uh, Xi Jinping said the Chinese people hope for a better life for people in other countries as well as for themselves. And he has been leading China to make that hope come true. This successful story has provided countries around the world, especially those uh, developing countries and least developed countries, with a model of good governance. With the help of party diplomacy, the CPC can demonstrate what a responsible major countries should do. They can uh, coordinate with the political parties from all over the world to communicate global problems to find out the common solutions to effectively push forward the cooperation on a global scale and to achieve truly uh, good uh, global governance. Uh, secondly, uh, China's party diplomacy is a diplomacy in which the CPC is the main body while all the democratic parties participate together. On the one hand, the CPC is the primary actor of China's party diplomacy. In the history of uh, People's Republic of China foreign relations, the party diplomacy led by the CPC has always played a unique role. No matter when it is during the revolution, socialist construction or reform and opening up a sense, CPC has maintained close contacts with uh, political parties from all over the world and promoted China's diplomacy to a certain extent. Uh, during these years, what, China's, uh, what Chinese communist has been doing is to better the lives of uh, Chinese people, um, rejuvenate the Chinese nation and promote peace and development, development of human, humanity. <clears throat> Sorry. This means that the main task of CPC diplomacy work is to serve the national regional nation and to make contributions to the progress of human civilization. While answering the fundamental questions of what has happened to the world and how to respond, uh, Xi Jinping has offered China's proposition to build a community with a shared future for mankind a concept that has been ensured in the CPC's constitution and has also been guiding Chinese interaction with the rest of the world. On the other hand, China has built up a system of multi-party cooperation and political consultation 
under the leadership of CPC. Based on this, the democratic parties have been also uh, important promoters in party diplomatic activities. As close friends of CPC, the, dem the democratic parties have long been of great significance in promoting friendly exchange with foreign parties, publishing uh, Chinese policies and plans, and improving China's national image. Uh, thirdly, Chinese party diplomacy has been promoted through two ways. In an important speech delivered and the uh, ceremony making, uh, marking the uh, centenary of the CPC in Beijing on uh, July the 1st, 2021, Xi Jinping has shown the confidence of Chi uh, CPC to the world. He said, uh, we must follow our old paths. This is the back rock that underpins all the serials and practice of our party. More than that, it is the historical conclusion our party has drawn from its struggles over the past century. <clears throat> Socialism with Chinese character, uh, characteristics is the fundamental achievements of the party and the people forged through innumerable hardships and great sacrifices, and it is the right path for us to achieve national rejuvenation. With such confidence and uh, demand uh, determination, the CBC has actually promoted policy diplomacy. On the bilateral way, CBC has carried out di direct one-to-one -one exchanges between the CBC and uh, political parties in other countries. In addition to uh, in addition to traditional contact measures, uh, the CBC continued to introduce new ways of. Um, such as a uh, few visits, holding cinemas or conference. Also, in order to achieve the goal of party exchanges, help economic and trade activities, CPC has injected economic factors into the process of uh, party di diplomacies. Moreover, uh, CPC has been pushing the cooperation in the multilateral level, for example, uh, in October the 2015, the Asian Political Party Zero Conference has been held in Beijing. On November the 26th, 2020, the first dialogue between the CPC and the political parties of Southeast Asia countries had been held in Nanning, Guangxi province. Um, also, uh, on Lu, uh, you can yeah. also uh, wrap up in one minute. Yes, thank you. Mm -hmm. yeah, so those. Um, yeah, so those uh, multilateral activists have, uh, have created a good atmosphere of politics and public opinions from promoting multilateral cooperation, uh, emphasize the role of political parties as an uh, important force for human progress, and show that CPC was willing to work together with the political parties of all countries to be a builder of world peace a contributor of global development and a defender of international order. So that's my point. Thank you uh, for your kind arrangement. Thanks again. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for your presence and sharing deep insight about how CPC has um, our priest to the global level as well. Thank you so much for your presence. I'm just sharing it's been created in a fact that to collect and connect people from different parts of the world on media, academicians, business, uh, to know that who are working where and uh, which country to about China and of course BRI. So this is our honor that uh, many friends have joined us. Um, today I'm so honored that um, a friend from um, uh, Mr. Song Ruhua, who is the founder of Silk Road City Alliances, China, who is a researcher at the China Institute of International Studies, who is the Secretary General of the China Public Diplomacy Association, and also remain uh, is the founder of the Beijing Belt and Road Cooperative Community, has joined us also from Beijing. Thank you so much, uh, Mr. Song. The floor is all yours, and we would love to hear from you about your experience and how the CPC has uh, created such a marvelous contribution in building such a, a wonderful nation, of course, country and globally. Uh, and we are also, uh, you know, many congratulations for the work done. So, Mr. Song, 
The floor is all yours. Thank you. Thank you, <laughs> Ms. Faha Asif. Uh, distinguished guests and friends, good afternoon. First of all, I would like to express my gratitude in the name of CPC member uh, to the leaders of Institute of Peace and a Diplomatic Institute for hosting this important event. As well noted by many friends, the celebration of 100, 100 year CPC is not only a big and a historic event for the Chinese people, but also a big surge of interest by many international friends to know CPC. So why CPC can survive 100 years from around only 50 founders now become the world's biggest political party of the world with um, 95, uh, over 95 million of our party members. And why this party is still be beloved by the majority of the Chinese people and uh, many international friends. So it's, uh, it's amazing, why? So maybe to answer these questions in your mind, I would like to share with you an uh, interesting a short video together with you, uh, conducted by China Daily. I think that will maybe can uh, uh, present you several facts through this video. So please. That's what I'm. Yes, friends can share the screen easily. Yes, yes. Okay. <coughs> mm -hmm. Can can you watch? Yeah, we can watch, but we cannot hear. Can uh, the voice yeah. can be improved? You you cannot hear. Yeah, we cannot hear. We can watch it. The, uh -huh. We can watch the entire thing, but we cannot hear the voices. I guess there the voice. It's a missing and the control yeah. program. So that can help you. Yeah. You see this is something. So you so you guys. So. You run your team soon. No. Hmm. My meaning is. Maybe uh well. to the number of dollars you should. Uh, the, so can you can watch you but uh, you still new sound new voice uh, a bit of sound, not much, not much of the sound, uh, but we can watch okay. it. Okay. We can watch uh, it. Uh -huh. yes. Come on, let's see. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 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 Um, uh, Mr. Song, what we can yes, do is maybe. that we can we can we can see it later. Yeah, yeah. Um, okay, maybe it, you we can, can share it. Yes, we can share uh -huh. it later. Yes, yes. we can. Yeah, we can uh, send 
send the video to uh, uh, to you, and you can share the video with uh, with your, with the friends. Yes, why not? Sure, why not? We can share it anywhere on Facebook okay. on many other regions. Yes, we'll yeah, share yeah, that. Yeah. We'll do that. Uh -huh, yeah, wonderful. Uh -huh. Thank you. Thank you for sharing this important video. Yes. Okay, thank you, and uh, uh, thank you very much. And uh, I would like also would like to take this opportunity to ex express our willingness to cooperate with uh, with your institute to promote bilateral uh, cooperation. And in fact, to waiting with uh, your embassy in Beijing <clears throat> to celebrate <clears throat> the 70th uh, anniversary of uh, the bilateral uh, diplomatic relations. So we have very good relations, and we also uh, donated uh, uh, some materials to through your embassy in Beijing <clears throat> to Pakistan. We donated uh, some uh, masks and to help the, um, the your people to fight against uh, the COVID nineteen virus. So we <clears throat> will continue to do so if uh, you have any need in the in the future. Yes, we are stronger together. Thank you so much for cooperating with us. Thank you so much for your presence and showing us a wonderful video. We'll be sharing this with our colleagues, students, uh, faculty yeah. members, media people, so that they know that so what is the history exactly. So thank you so much for introducing this okay. video also, yeah. and we will definitely be collaborating. Um, I'm so honored. Thank you so much for your presence. I am so honored that today uh, we've been joined by our very dear friend from um, from, from, you know, friends from different parts of the world has joined us. And Mr. Yeah, Olaf, yeah, um, chairman of the Belt and Road Institute, Sweden has also joined, yeah, who is also the editor of the Shale Institute newsletter of, um, and also looking after um, various uh, insights from Sweden about China. He's also the former chairman of the Social Democratic Youth Club, and of course, former chairman of the Anti-Drug Coalition in Sweden. Uh, thank you so much, Mr. Sanmar, for thank your you. presence. You. Um, are you, can you hear us? Yes, I can hear, hear you well. Can you hear me? Yes. yes, we can hear you very well. Thank you so much for your presence. And the floor is all yours. OK. Well, uh, I'm an economist, so uh, my take on uh, China, uh, the Chinese Communist Party uh, is that uh, it is, is underestimated the, the success of, of the of the economic performance of the common of China. Uh, normally, you you measure this with the GDP figures, gross national product, and this is absolutely ridiculous uh, measurement. It's it's a measurement, uh, basically a monetarist measurement, and the more money you spend, the, the more uh, you can spend it on anything in a car crash or anything, and this increases the, 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 the performance of the economy according to the GDP. So actually the, the UN Sustainable Development Goals measurement is actually quite much, much better. It measures the, the success on the, the uh, stopping the, as the first point to stop poverty. And in this way, China is already the champion in the world. So uh, the next uh, the goal is is health and and um, and then it's power and then it's education. So in this this way, these are things that China has measured up to in a very uh, significant way and is in this way in the top of of, of performance according to these development goals. However. Uh, these goals are, are just uh, measuring the, the, the performance in the past. I work with the Schiller Institute and, and our uh, founder and uh, uh, the, the, the late Mr. Lyndon LaRouche, he always told us to measure in the potential. And if you measure the, the potential, you look to the future performance and the possibility for future development, and this is uh, much more in the in the in the real uh, uh, e economic performance because then you measure uh, what you are planning for, what you are looking for, what is the hope of the nation you are looking for for the future, and in and what is the plan for the future, and if you look to 
to the potential. And Mr. Rushi, he, he measured uh, this with the help of a, a few categories. And this is uh, a way to do this was just to, to measure the, the, the growth of the economy in, in certain categories, but you cannot measure them from year to year because all these measurements are changing. If you introduce a new technology, the, the old measurements of, for instance, the steel production or, 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 or car production or something like that, it is, um, it is changing. Uh, there is not the same cost to produce the, the, the cars or the steel from year to year because there is an improvement of technology. And this means that you cannot measure uh, the figures from year to year, just looking at them. So he said, we must measure them as a whole, the, the, the performance of the, of, the, of the economy as a whole, and then you measure the, 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 the performance in the way of how the, the, the whole economy is, is, is a better potential for uh, increasing the, 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 the development. And he called this uh, the, the, uh, the potential, the, uh, the relative potential uh, population density. And if you have a good economy, you can have a better population density. And this population density is relative to the uh, uh, natural resources, to the, to the uh, conditions that are naturally in the country, but also especially to the uh, performance of the nation to develop the education, to develop the infrastructure, to develop what is uh, uh, the, the potential to have an efficient economy in the future. So in this way, the, the, the measurement can only be done from year to year between all the figures of the same year. And if you look to, to the relative potential, uh, potential density of each year, then you can successively look to how the whole potential de density is improving. And in this way, you can look to uh, the potential development. And this is a very exact figure. And in this way, you can see that China is uh, uh, working in this direction. Actually, China is in, in, in its uh, uh, new plan uh, using much less figures. They are using more of these figures of, of, um, of culture, for instance. They have put in the, the next uh, plan to have 5% of the economy devoted to development of culture. And this is absolutely something that is un unmeasurable if you look to GDP or something like that. But it is promoting the, the potential development of the nation in a tremendous way because the, the, the culture is very much connected to the improvement of, of creativity, in, improvement of innovation. And innovation is the most crucial factor how to develop an economy. So to put in such a figure like 5% development of, 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 of culture in an economic plan is, is, is a very advanced way of, of, of doing planning. And it makes China into a very efficient uh, uh, planning uh, pro process. And this is uh, uh, also showing that China in the future will, will, will develop in this way. So my take is that the, the, the Chinese uh, economic performance is much underrated. If you look to the tremendous development of, of infrastructure, if you look to the tremendous development of education, of science, of the, of the space program, of these kind of things is creating such a potential for the future that it's, 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 uh, you, you can't see it in any, in any other country. And in this way, you have a potential that is, uh, could be more to the, to the uh, show what is the real economic uh, put, uh, uh, performance of, of the Chinese economy. So 
I think uh, I can leave it at there as an introduction, but this is uh, my, my statement, which I was uh, sending to, to China, and I also had an article published in China Daily covering this statement. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mr. Sanma, for this outstanding. Of course, uh, when 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 scholars and practitioners and people like you are looking at how this trend is building, uh, we always um, feel to see amazing happenings. I mean, look at how poverty has been elevated, uh, how amazing the work has been done. I mean, it's amazing to see and learn from the experiences of the people from China. Thank you so much for your presence and always. Uh, Always, uh, your uh, you know, enriching the conversation. Thank you so much. Um, you. Now, I would like to request my friend who is uh, uh, who is from Nepal. Thank you so much, who has joined us from Nepal, Mr. Gosam, who is the director of China Study Center and work as consultant to different uh, international organization, including USAID and World Bank, and provided uh, consultancy services, uh, including the um, you know promote water institutions, uh, partnerships, global water partnerships, of course. Um, and he has uh, been engaged in dialogue with partner institutions in China, including China Association for International Friendly Contact and China Association for International Understanding. So Dr. Gotham is here. Thank you so much for your presence. Floor is all yours, Dr. Sir. Thank you very much. You see that uh, it's a very good afternoon, I would call it. And a very good afternoon to all distinguished friends over here. We are here to mark the centennial of CPC. We gather here at the prestigious in Pakistan Institute of Peace and Development and Diplomatic Studies to celebrate CPC's cultivated new culture of cooperation and partnership. We have reached this stage after China's long struggle and huge sacrifices. In this context, I would like to place my views on some basics of CPC. The first basic is, it is a force of national liberation. Founding of PRC was the first primary task of CPC. It is CPC's most glorious patriotic accomplishment. Without liberation from the devastating colonial and feudal impact, a country cannot choose its independent path, be rich, unified, confident, and strong. And this is, perhaps we can take it as a very big lesson from China. The second is CPC's ability to maintain a red bloodline. The red, red, red uh, line also holds a preemptive defensive strategy on the socialist governance system with Chinese characteristics and China's territorial integrity. I think I don't have to ex explain it any further over here. And the third basics of CPC is its ability to maintain and value history and culture of partnership and cooperation because CPC wa always wanted to share it. That is one of the fundamental basic. It has never said that I just, we just want to prosper and develop and be strong. And uh, that is something which encourages a country like Nepal very much. And uh, I will just give you an example over here. In, in sense, Silk Road has become a powerful analogy for modern Belt and Road Initiated Cooperation for Global Reconstruction and Connectivity. The new Silk Road rejuvenates China, land and maritime civilization. So what I'm saying that the root is in history, which CP CPC has never forgotten. And they are regenerating it, re-innovating it and revitalizing it which is a great sort of things. So always history teaches us and we have to learn out of it. And here I would just like to add a new dimension which has been added over here institutionally. 
The latest interregional addition to partnership and cooperation is the Chongqing based China South Asia Center of Poverty Elevation and Co Cooperative Development within the B BRC framework. Here I am mentioning it because I'm also, uh, Nepal is also part of South Asia. And poverty elevation is perhaps our biggest task over here. And we have been very much fragmented over this task. And what I think that because of my experience in China and especially working in the rural areas, I can just tell you one thing that even in China is a country when once I was working in Xinjiang, the, a farmer was asking me that how to make the Chinese agricultural products competitive as China has been a member, become a member of WTO. I worked in Guyana, I worked in elsewhere in South Asia as well. I, worked, I have been working in Nepal. No way a farmer has asked me this kind of question. And that shows even the level of the farmer, the kind of consciousness, you see that, the kind of awareness they had in terms of becoming very competitive. That was something I always remember. Now the, the final thing, the basic thing, which I would like to put over here is CPC's futuristic vision. While celebrating the centenary, it wishes to make the occasion a trailblazer for forging intergenerational friendly ties with people all over the world. This is indeed a legitimate and genuine wish as confrontational ecology floats up. And this is uh, rather we have to be, give, be very attentive to as a neighbor, being as a neighbor of China. The 21st century double centenary happiness to China to neighbors and to the world, sure faces a quality transformation characterized by distributive justice and the new security standards. And this is something that I think, even on the border management sort of thing, China has been trying to encourage us to come up with the new security guidelines, even you see that in the context of the COVID, because that was never a consideration in our border management. And when we say border management, it relates to the mobility of the people, especially the local people, which is something of, of very high significance to us. And here, I would like to end my this small note with my gratefulness to the distinguished organizers for give, giving me this opportunity to share my some of the views on this historic occasion. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Dr. Gautam, for, for your presence and your insight, in fact. Uh, I, I cannot, I, you know, it's, it's such an honor to view, to hear your views about CPC and as you were sharing about the, uh, you know, it's not only, uh, what I see is not only an ideology, but an action-oriented steps forward and building people along. Thank you so much for sharing these thoughts with us. Um, now, ladies and gentlemen, I would like to request uh, Dr. Zahid Anwar, who is the Director of China Study Center and Dean of the University, uh, Dean of Social Sciences, University of uh, Peshawar. Uh, he's also the editor of the Central Asian Research Center and has been supervising uh, many PhD scholars um, under the Higher Education Commission. And uh, China Study Center is also happened to be the partner of the Institute of Peace and Diplomatic Studies. Professor Zahid Anwar, floor is all yours. Um, Professor Zahid Anwar, can you hear us? Thank you. Professor Zahid Anwar, can you hear us? Yes. Uh, thank, thank you, you. Dr. Zahid. Thank you. Uh, Floor is all yours, Dr. Saab. Uh, Madam Parhat Asif, uh, thank you to uh, Institute of Peace and uh, Diplomatic Studies. I am thankful to your institute for giving me the opportunity to share my uh, thoughts on CPC. Uh, I learned a lot from the uh, learned speakers. They talked about 
uh, Communist Party of China in its uh, 100 year struggle for people's welfare, people's happiness. Uh, thank you very much. It's an honor and it's a privilege. Uh, so far, uh, uh, China is an ancient civilization with a history of more than 5,000 years. China has made indelible contribution to the progress of human civilization. The Communist Party of China, which was founded in July uh, 1921 in Shanghai, contributed a lot so far people's happiness and welfare is concerned. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, the CPC is playing a vital role in the development of the country since its foundation a century ago. We're seeing the country's rapid economic growth and rise as a global economic power. A good understanding of Chinese Communist Party is a gateway to understanding contemporary China. It's, it is the world's largest ruling party with 91 million members, as some speakers have just mentioned. Also, the CPC has transformed a developing country into the world's second largest economy. It's a marvelous uh, 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 task uh, which uh, CPC has accomplished with the support of Chinese people. The party's guiding principles are enshrined in its constitution, the general program of which states the Communist Party of China takes Marxism, Leninism, Mao, Maoism thought, Mao thought, Deng Xiaoping theory, uh, the important thought of three represents and the scientific outlook on development as its guide to action. Since the very day of its foundation, the party is striving for seeking happiness for the Chinese people and rejuvenation for the Chinese nation as its aspiration and mission, its mission of CPC. All the struggle, sacrifice and creation through which the party has united and led the Chinese people over the past hundred years has been tied together by one ultimate theme, bringing about the great rejuvenation of Chinese nation. Ladies and gentlemen, CPC has shown a technocratic capacity to respond to the developmental stress brought on by China marvelous economic rise. Today, the party has harnessed the rewards of globalization and economic development, lifting tens of millions of people out of poverty. CPC has reimagined itself as a driver of change, guiding the country's path to wealth and fueling a sentiment of national pride. Ideologically speaking, socialism with Chinese characteristic for modernization, it is glorious to be rich, black and white cat theory. Uh, these some thoughts inspired Chinese youth and particularly Deng Xiaoping economic reforms. It, uh, it gave a new, uh, new, uh, 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 new drive and new uh, push to, uh, to forward development. As the party marks its what, 100 years anniversary in 2021, it faces many challenges, including COVID-19 pandemic and climate crisis. It coped, cope, it uh, tackled successfully COVID-19, not only uh, uh, saved Chinese people from COVID, but its friends and neighbors, and particularly the people of Pakistan, uh, uh, appreciate the, the solid support of Chinese nation so far tackling the problem, the pandemic of COVID-19 was concerned. A country cannot prosper without a capable political party and a political party cannot grow without strong leaders. And so far, supreme uh, leaders of China, re recent leaders are concerned, the, the contribution of Deng Xiaoping, the contribution of Jiang Zemin, the contribution of Hu Jintao, and the contribution of President Xi Jinping will be remembered. China's success is essentially attributable to the CPC's solid leadership that guided its course. Based on a torrent of pandemic control measures, from drastic lockdowns to mass testing and contact tracking, China leadership 
not only brought the disease under control, but also has since managed to sustain an extremely low level of infection. And today we are witnessing that China was the only major world economy to expand in a year dominated by COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, distinguished speakers and honorable participants, President Xi Jinping said, and I quote, to realize the Chinese road, we must spread the Chinese spirit, which combines the spirit of the nation with patriotism is the core and the spirit of the time with reform and innovation is the core, uh, unquote. Standing on the same balcony where Mao Zedong announced the founding of the People's Republic in 1949, Chinese President Xi Jinping marked the century of the ruling Communist Party on Thursday by declaring completion of its goal of creating a moderately prosperous society. Uh, the Chinese Communist Party priority Priority is the people's happiness. Ang Long is uh, the people feel happy, they are safe. Security has been ensured. China will continue to rise and will play its positive role for the betterment of the people and for the world. Committed to peaceful development, China will enhance its partnership with other countries to step up its contribution to mean mankind development. Distinguished speakers, CPC centennial history is featured by the theme of tireless struggle, ideological exploration, and internal development. And over its century old life, CPC has constantly committed itself to the happiness of Chinese people, the rejuvenation of the Chinese nation, and the common good of the world. The people of Pakistan rejuvenate the economic success of Chinese nation. People in Pakistan consider China its people and its leading party, all were their friends. China provided solid support to Pakistan in every difficult situation, and Pakistan has supported China, its iron brother, and many global and regional issues. China and Pakistan friendship is based on five principles of peaceful coexistence, which provided a sound basis for this robust relationship. The people of Pakistan, inspired by the vital role of CPC for the welfare of Chinese people, especially by its recent supreme leaders. In international political economy, China has opted for win-win model and discarded zero-sum model. This model is considered an opportunity by the developing nation. Under BRI and especially CPEC, China-Pakistan Economic Corridor, Pakistan and China, are striving its course for a shared and prosperous future. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Professor Dr. Zahid Anwar, for speaking our heart uh, from Pakistani perspective and how we view CPC and, of course, the China Pakistan Economic Corridor, Pakistan China's seven decades long a strong partnership and friendship that is ever growing. Thank you so much for your presence. Now I would like to request Dr. Rajendra. Who, is, um, who has joined us from Sri Lanka. Uh, Dr. Rajendra has a claimed career, of course, uh, and has remained um, serving at different positions, including uh, one of the you know, recent one is founder and president association for Sri Lanka, China, social and cultural cooperation. And he's also um, advisor Sri Lanka, uh, China journalist forum, French ambassador, China former head of the media, uh, and Ministry of Labor, Sri Lanka. Um, while I will be requesting Dr. Uh, Andre for for his uh, remarks, um, I, I would I, I'm 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 so honored that he has joined us also. Um, I'm honored that uh, Mr. Adran, the, um, the floor is all yours. Uh, can Can I see you, uh, Mr. Adranra? Adran Taranda, who is the founder and president of the Association for Sri Lanka. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you um, for inviting can, can you open your mic? Yes, yeah, thank you so much. Thank you. Yeah. I hope that I'm pronouncing your na name right. Yeah. I'm Indra Nand. <laughs> thank you. Thank yeah. you. Thank you for your presence. The floor is all yours. Good afternoon, all friends. It is indeed my great pleasure to participate at the webinar. 100 Years of Communist Party of China, Views of the Globe, organized by the Institute of Peace and Diplomatic Studies. 
Communist Party of China, the greatest political party of the world, the party who leads the country and the people for magnificent and extraordinary social and economic development. China became the world's second largest economy and the first developing country to achieve the United Nations Sustainable Development Goal on Poverty Eradication under the leadership of Communist Party of China. Despite China's massive and multi-ethnic population, the Communist Party of China has managed to preserve the unity and harmony of all the people. Peace among all the minority nationalities. This is very important to a country to go ahead with the targets without unrest. I can point out uh, 11 reasons behind the CPC miracle of achievements. First, Communist Party of China is in pursuit high ideals. Secondly, Communist Party of China has always attached importance to theoretical innovation. Thirdly, Communist Party of China has a mechanism for selecting the best. Fourthly, Communist Party of China has strict discipline and rules. Fifthly, Communist Party of China is constantly reforming and improving itself. Sixthly, Communist Party of China provides strong leadership. Seventhly, Communist Party of China always adhere to the lofty philosophy of people-centered development to firmly uphold the fundamental interest of all Chinese people. Eighthly, Communist Party of China always stick to the party's leadership and give full play to the advantages of the socialist system. Ninthly, Communist Party of China always explore new development philosophies in line with the China's national conditions in response to evolving circumstances. Tenthly, Communist Party of China always ensure that the party exercises effective self-supervision and seeks self-governance and maintain excellent vitality and vigor. Lastly, Communist Party of China always persist in working for the cause of human progress and contributing to global peace and development. Recent years, we witnessed massive poverty alleviation campaign. In just seven years, Communist Party of China lifted nearly 100 million people out of poverty and eradicated absolute poverty. Poverty eradication is the most vivid demonstration of the philosophy of putting people front and center. Since 1978, China has lifted 770 million rural residents out of poverty, which accounts for more than 70% of the global total over the same period. That means China have achieved the poverty reduction targets set out in the UN 2030 agenda a decade ahead of schedule. I must say one of the main reasons for this achievement is the leadership of Communist Party of China. Since the 18th National Congress of Communist Party of China, General Secretary Xi Jinping himself has been working to command, strategize, and oversee efforts to reduce poverty. He has attended to many conferences, investigations, field visits on poverty alleviation. Under his leadership, millions of party officials have worked hard with concrete measures. This is the spirit of Chinese communists. General Secretary Xi Jinping is a party leader and people's leader who has a great vision. His vision is unique to the country as well as the entire world. Since the 18th National Congress of Communist Party of China, he attached great and important attention to the formation, of, uh, formation and implementation of discipline of the party. He opened a path to explore the mistakes and correct it. He cleaned corruption of the party. Communist Party of China became more and more wiser with these actions. With his determination, Communist Party of China became both ruling and revolutionary party. General Secretary Xi Jinping always stressed the importance of building the party with ideology and strengthening the party with theories. The Communist Party of China created a history of striving for independence and prosperity for the nation as well as liberation and happiness for the people. Without the leadership of Communist Party of China, Chinese nation cannot be where they are now in terms of social and economic achievements. Communist Party of China work for the well-being of the Chinese people, for the rejuvenation of the Chinese nation, as well as for the peace and development of mankind. Over the past 100 years, Communist Party of China united and led the people 
to build their country by self-reliance and hard work, and then to fight the battle against poverty with strong determination, concerted efforts, and unwavering faith. The Communist Party of China has always relied on the people, served the people, and been deeply rooted in the people. The Communist Party of China and the Chinese people are never inseparable. Communist Party of China comes from the people and serves the people. Its origin, original aspiration and mission has always been to seek the happiness of the Chinese people. Communist Party of China shoulders the great mission of national rejuvenation, unites the, mobilizes various social forces and leads China to a path of peaceful rise. Communist Party of China actively promotes the building a community with a shared future for mankind and firmly seeks peace and development for humanity and ready to march towards socialism with Chinese characteristics for new era. Today, the Chinese people are more confident than ever in the path, theory, system, and culture of socialism with Chinese characteristics. There are 6,000 parties in the world. Out of that, more, more than 60 parties are 100 years old. Concluding my speech, I must say all the parties should learn from Communist Party of China to achieve common prosperity with strong social and economic development. Once again, I would like to thank Ms. Farhat Asif, founder president, and Mr. Asif Noor, founding director of IPDS, of inviting me to this excellent meeting. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mr. Biskera, for your outstanding speech of comments, of course, sharing the insight about CPC coming from Sri Lanka and your extended uh, wonderful work that you have been doing in building relationship of your country with the Chinese people and, of course, with us Pakistanis as well. Thank you so much for your presence. Um, and, of course, uh, let me share a few of the more glimpses of Friends of PRI Forum before I ask my uh, acclaimed professor and colleague, of course, um, to conclude and share his views. Uh, Friends of BRI Forum, uh, ladies and gentlemen, we have been uh, arranging a web and series of webinar. We had uh, launched it in um, early um, this year, and then we hosted a webinar on uh, Friends of BRI Forum on how uh, media media outlets can be collaborated. We have hosted a webinar on how academic linkages can be hosted from different countries of the world. They were there. Then we hosted a webinar on how uh, the countries can be can be uh, you know uh, cl come close together through enterprises. Um, then we hosted we are we are planning to host see this this again is another uh, uh, important uh, step in, in towards that direction uh, building dialogue how we can learn through through actions and of course this this is CPC is not just an ideology it's just not a political party it's just uh, giving us a heap, as uh, my friend from Sri Lanka has shared that it has built, uh, you know, an inspiration for us all how to learn. And then we'll be hosting a webinar on um, on how um, friends across the countries can build the relationship on agricultural cooperation. Then we'll be hosting another one on technology cooperation and and so for, so on and so forth. So we'll continue having these kind of conversation ongoing so that we know that not only countries um, we cannot do our work in isolation and just one country, but BRI has given us the opportunity to reach out to the countries. Uh, currently, there are 138 countries on BRI, we, all us together in the community, and we need to know each other so that we can build synergies, build our future together with our Chinese counterparts uh, and across the world. Thank you so much, everybody. Now, I would like to request uh, Professor Dr. Wang Li, who is an acclaimed professor on, on diplomacy. Um, he's a professor on security, security as well from Jilin University, of China. He's also remained as a research fellow um, in School of Law in, in, in Holland, of course, a visiting professor in different international uh, centers, and uh, has written several uh, important books on diplomacy. And we have always been an honor to have him on. On the on, on the webinars, uh, we always learn from him and Dr. Wang Li. Thank you so much for your kind presence, and you will be concluding the not only sharing your own views but will also be concluding uh, with the, with honor. Uh, you will be concluding this this entire webinar. So floor is all yours, Dr. Professor Dr. Wang Li.
Thank you very much, my friend. And it is my great honor to talk to the student, to, to the friends, the, the, the new friends and old friends. And I don't want to say this is a conclusion because I'm not in that position. I'm just an academic person. And uh, I think I have no any political position in China or outside China. And uh, I'm a, a pure academic. So what I want, what I have, what I will present it is my academic view. But I'm the person who experienced the Chairman Mao. I was born and grew up during the Chairman Mao's period. And I studied at a, as a college student and then went to America and Britain and Europe during the Deng Xiaoping's period. Then I returned back to China to teach and watch China stronger, stronger day by day during the Xi Jinping's period, of course, and also uh, Hu Jintao and, uh, and Jiang Zemin, but uh, I want to emphasize the President Xi Jinping, his leadership. And uh, so because of this, I have experienced the three, gener three generations of CCP leadership. I will be happy to say that I have a personal, economic, academic, intellectual understanding of our CPP and the CPC. First, why we need to emphasize the CPC when we discuss about China, the rise of China, the future of China, the, 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 we must emphasize the CPC. CPC is a political party, not the government, but why we need to emphasize CPC. Second, what, when we discuss about the rise of China, why we need to, why we need to understand the P CPC's the rule and the leadership and the statecraft. The third thing is that uh, under the leadership of CPC headed by President Xi Jinping, can China become a real global power? That is my three uh, questions. And uh, now, not quite three points. To understand, briefly, to understand the modern China, to understand the China's strong determined determin determination to be a great power. We need to understand the China's modern history. I have no time to discuss about Chinese history, but we need to understand that from the modern period, China suffered too much, too long. So the national independence is the first uh, histor historical task. Who completed Ch Chinese CP CPC and the leadership of Chairman Mao? Okay, so no matter the later generation discuss about Chairman Mao's, Marries or Miss Marys during the Cultural Revolution, we cannot deny it is Chairman Mao and the Mao's generation, of course, the pre, uh, Premier Zhou Enlai, Deng Xiaoping, he's the first generation of CPC completed the national independence in 1949. After almost 30, 30 years since the founding of the CPC, 1921 to 1949, 1950, the CPC suffered too much, and but led the United Chinese people to up, achieve the, the real national independence. The Kuomintang didn't uh, complete that. Any government didn't, but CPC. However, CPC never stopped that. CPC want to make China, make China as a strong country, as Chairman Mao said. China stand up, but not. Uh, enough, we want to be a great power to make a contribution to the world. So from, uh, from 1949, 1950 to 1979, during the 30 years, China started the modernization. Yes, when Chairman Mao died in 1976, China economic was not so strong. That is, that, uh, that is, that means the GDP per capita in terms of the GDP, total GDP, GDP, China was not that bad because China foundation was very low. And also because, the, because of the Cold War, China, the first generation had to pay attention to the national security. So by 1979, 19, 1970s, late 1970s, China was not rich. Chinese people were not rich, but the, over the past 30 years, China was never invaded by any foreign countries. No, no any foreign countries invaded China. 
who committed, who defended Chinese national security and the territory integrity? Mao's generation, Mao Zedong's generation, the first generation. However, Deng Xiaoping great because he emphasized that poverty is not the Chinese term. China must be a wealthy country. So Deng Xiaoping continued to second the historical task to make China economic, economically strong and wealthy. So Deng Xiaoping start open China to the world. I benefited from, from the openness and the reform. I went to study in America, Britain, Europe because of Deng Xiaoping's period. So during this period, China economic demand so fast. So I have, no, I have so many stories to share with you, but we have no time. I just want to give you one example. When I was at Harvard, I saw everything was made in Hong Kong, Taiwan, and South Korea. Very simple items. I, was, I feel very sad. I talked to my professor. Actually, he's a just for now. <laughs> he said, don't worry. Next is your China. After 20 years, after 10 years, only 10 years, you know, in America, everything, almost everything made in China. So China had been changed. Then I went to Britain to, to study for my PhD. Now China is not, its economic is going up and also the Chinese CPC emphasize high technology. Deng Xiaoping agreed and his successors agreed because they, they emphasize high technology. Without high technology, only, per, only made in China doesn't make sense. This is why Xi Jinping is so popular, supported by Chinese people, including me, because he emphasized eventually high technology is, is the key to the economic quality, not only the quantity. So let me tell you one case. When I was in, in Britain in, in 2002 or three, my, my, my colleague went to my office, shake my hand, Wang Li, congratulations. I was shocked, what, what happened? The Chinese first Taikongren astronaut, Yang Li Wei, was sent to the, in, the, in the space. At that time, they realized China not only can produce the, the, the pants, the clothes, the items, the, the home electronic, China also go marching into a high, high technology power. So now, Deng, now Xi Jinping more emphasize quality of, of production and also he emphasized the three E's. Economics must go up, but we must pay attention to the environmental and the energy saving. So what does that mean? That means the Chinese lead, the, China, the CPC leaderships, they emphasize China going, going forward consistently, persistently, and with high qualities. So because of this, I would like to say that now China and the leadership of Xi Jinping, we enter, we are confident, we are more confident enter the third stage of making China stronger. But a, chi a strong China doesn't mean China want to seek a hegemon like America, no. China want to make more contribution. That is true the, from the Chinese culture, from the Chinese ideology, the CPC's ideology. China always want to share with the people. Developing country, why developing country is always the foundation of China foreign policy. Great powers, neighbors, and the developing country. Developing country is a minority. So far, developing country are not very rich. China need to share our expertise and China's assistance. Of course, China need the developing country diplomatically, economically, and uh, natural resources. We, together, we can go further and faster. This is, a, this is a President Xi Jinping's co-ideas. So summary, what I want to say that first, it is, a, it is the CPC's leadership, China complete national independence. It is a hard work and the guidance of the CPC, China has achieved 
so far economic success. China is second largest economics, but China aim to higher, okay? And uh, now China will keep going, continue to the third stage to be a real global power. I believe under the CPC leadership, China can finish that. First, Chinese, the CPC can mobilize the most resources in China. Second, China CPC has a long term of long term plan. And also the most another very important is that the CPC leaders, they have a strategic long term vision. So the CPC leaders, they have a capability, they have a wisdom, they have the visions to, to take China to be to be able to realize China's dreams. By 2040, 2050, it doesn't matter. Eventually, China will complete its national dream. So we must understand the CPC if you want to understand the PRC. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Professor Dr. Wang. It's always an amazing to hear you and understand uh, the essence of what exactly is um, the CPC and how uh, to understand China through, of course, your wisdom is always an asset. And we learn from you, of course, and sharing the stage um, with all the colleagues who had joined us from different parts of the world. I mean, this was uh, an essence of um, how not only worldview China, but of course, how Chinese see the um, Communist Party of China and how they see the wisdom. Thank you so much, uh, Professor Dr. Wang Li, for your presence. And I'm so honored that uh, today I've been joined by the acclaimed professors and friends from across the world. Uh, first of all, I'm grateful for the, uh, you know, the congratulatory letter from Ms. Zhang Wei, who is the Secretary General of the Good Labor Relations and Friendship uh, Corporation from China's SEO committee. Thank you so much for your uh, warm letter. Uh, Ms. Pang, thank you so much with the Minister Consular and Embassy of People's Republic of China. Thank you so much for your remarks and your support always. Uh, Mr. Tao, thank you so much for your presence and your uh, wonderful work heading this important organization, China People's Association for Peace and Determinement. Thank you so much. Uh, Professor Harvey, who is a senior fellow, of course, Chancellor for China and globalization, his wisdom, and of course, an asset for us. Uh, Mr. Song, thank you so much for your presence. We always love to collaborate. Whoever wants to be, it's, it's the forum is always welcome. We would like to collaborate and build this, uh, you know, this, this, this work that has been done for the, not only for the hundred years, but for, for, for this uh, BRI that has sprouted out to share as uh, Professor Wong has changed, that it's not just only uh, the vis it's vision, wisdom, and uh, the, you know, sharing the, as my Sri Lanka friend was also saying, that it's about sharing the prosperity with each other. Uh, so we would like to share this as well. First, um, uh, Mr. San, uh, my friend uh, Biscara, from, thank you so much for your presence. Dr. Gautam, thank you so much for your presence. Uh, and Professor Zahid Anwar, uh, thank you so much for always supporting us in any way. And lastly, but not least, Dr. Professor Wang Li, thank you so much for sharing your wisdom and your presence. Um, this, these uh, webinar recordings will be there on our Facebook page, on our YouTube page. You, all those students who would like to understand um, China should understand CPC. It's just not, there's no other thing, you know, you need to understand how the uh, political party leadership people have worked so hard for the past all these years to build their nation to the place where are, they are today. And as uh, Dr. Wongli has said, it is just, I, I would also I like to add, it's not uh, emphasis on technology and it is about education, about research, about understanding, about knowledge as well. So this this is this is the essence, and I would like to share these um, important learnings for with the Pakistani colleagues and across the world. Thank you so much, everybody, for your kind presence, uh, and thank you so much. If you would like to collaborate with any partner who is here, um, you can also reach out to us. We would like to connect. 
because friends of bri forum is all about connectivity all about partnerships we'll all be together uh, in future as well thank you so much everybody for your presence i would like to end this webinar with a note that uh, this is just not a goodbye but it's just another again beginning we'll be meeting again thank you so much everybody and uh, goodbye and have goodbye. a good evening everybody who, yes thank you so much thank you so much Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.